Hey guys, really excited to jump into our third episode on this Revival History series. Today we're talking about Francis Asbury and the Circuit Riders. Take you into a moment, Francis Asbury is in his mid-twenties. His dad doesn't approve of him becoming a Methodist preacher. His fellow preachers recognize he's not a very good preacher, and his movement, Methodism, defined him as both commendable in his character and his obligations, his responsibility, but expendable, and that he wasn't really critical to their vision for what God was doing in England. But there comes an amazing moment in Asbury's life and in the future of Christianity where Wesley makes a call for someone who'd be willing to lay their lives down, leave their homes, leave their families, sail the ocean to a vast, unreached nation called America. And though Asbury finds himself expendable, he is burning in his heart knowing that he's to answer the call. And that answer would absolutely transform that nation and lead to the day we're in right now. All right, before we jump into the story today, we're going to talk about three main points uh, as threads in this story to draw personal application from. Number one, I don't know if I've ever read about a man who is more gritty and full of endurance than Francis Asbury. Number two, we're going to look at a man who was somewhat rejected and unempowered by his father who starts a movement that is literally based on empowering every believer to bring the kingdom. And number three, we're going to talk about the power of innovation, a man who looked at his times and said, this is good, but there's so much more. All right, as we jump into this story now, uh, I want to go back to Francis Asbury's childhood in a critical moment. And you'll find in all these stories and in your own story that some of our most difficult moments become our most defining moments. Asbury grows up in a somewhat godly home, um, you know, kind of just going through the motions. <clears throat> but as a young boy, his sister uh, tragically dies. And his mom goes into a deep and dark depression. Nothing could free her from this. And their family was struggling under the weight of her depression. In the midst of that, connected to John Wesley, these amazing Methodist preachers who are going out through the countryside. One arrives nearby, preaches the simple gospel message. And Francis's mom is delivered and set free from the darkness and depression that had tormented her. Doesn't this sound like so many of our own lives and our own stories that we've heard all around us today? We can't underestimate the power of the simple gospel. Can't underestimate the power of one person set free from the lies of the enemy and the ripple effects of their obedience. Young Francis would be the a direct effect, the direct result of that depression lifting in his mom's heart. And all of a sudden, Asbury finds himself at a young age in love with Jesus. His favorite moments, his highlight moments are these circuit rider preachers coming through town, sharing the gospel message, calling them to repentance. They would talk about how exciting these meetings were. Why? Because the Methodist preachers were so excited about Jesus. They were so excited about the gospel message, so people came with that kind of expectation. Now, Asbury should have followed in the footsteps of his father and his father's trade, but he feels as a young teenager that God is calling him to preach, calling him to join the Methodists, get a horse, and ride across the countryside so that the least and the last and the lost would, good, would hear the good news of Jesus. So Asbury obeys God. He joins the Methodist preachers, and he's assigned to the circuit, remote circuit in England, that everyone kind of knew was one of the more difficult circuits. Nobody really ever saw fruit there. And young Asbury in his early 20s, that's his assigned circuit. And true to everybody else's experience, he's not seeing any fruit. Hardly anyone's getting saved. And they're remarking on how he's not really a, a great preacher. Nobody looked at him and thought, this is a guy who's going to shake a nation. Nobody was thinking this is a future leader in the movement. They're looking on going like, as I said before, he's dependable, but he's expendable. And this was Francis Asbury. But now in his mid-20s, he goes to his first gathering of Methodist preachers, and he's so excited. Like, imagine this. He's one of the newest guys. He's one of the youngest guys. And honestly, his circuit's been really difficult. He can't wait to meet the John Wesley. He can't wait to be with these legendary circuit riders who've been 
fanning out across England, seeing revival and breakthrough everywhere they go. He meets at the new rooms in Bristol with all these other leaders, and you know, just you can feel the emotion of the meeting with someone like John Wesley leading the meeting, and you're looking around as a young leader at all these weathered, experienced, anointed preachers, and there's young Asbury, knowing that God's put a fire in his heart, but nobody's really looking at Asbury. John Wesley uh, makes this historic call. How many of you would be willing to lay your lives down? We know you love England. We know you've been contending for revival, but there's a nation across the ocean that is large and, and largely unreached. It's just ripe for the gospel. And he makes a call, who will go to America? Well, this is an interesting co- time to make a missionary call because the, there's br- brewing in the distance is the Revolutionary War. England and America are at odds. But this is not political motivation in the heart of these writers. It's kingdom motivation. And so in the midst of it, Francis Asbury raises his hand. And I, I can't, I don't we know exactly how that meeting went, but I would imagine a few other people kind of looked around and went, Asbury? Like, yeah, I guess we could send him because we don't really need him here, but will he really make a difference when he goes? What's behind that term that he was dependable and expendable? Asbury raises his hand, Wesley goes okay, lays hands on him and says to him, do you realize you may never come back? And Asbury says yes, by saying yes to God and sailing to America, I'm willing to never see my family again. I'm willing to never return home again. He paid a great price. And what's crazy is he lands in America and the Revolutionary War is brewing. Everybody's leaving. All the Methodist preachers are leaving. The other denominational movements, their leaders are leaving. This is intense. Like, put yourself in his shoes. You're landing on the shores of a nation that hates your nation because in their eyes, you represent the oppression and the tyranny of governments colliding and fighting. That's there as Asbury. But what do you do when you have a fire, a burden, an obedience in your heart? And Asbury refuses to leave. And he builds critical friendships through that season of the Revolutionary War. And when the war lifts and the fog clears, America looks on at this young British preacher with fondness, with loyalty, and with trust. What kind of man would stay through this war and and for a nation that he must love so much? And because of that, Asbury was granted massive favor in the new colonies. Now, let's go to another critical moment in Asbury's life, this innovation moment. Asbury, uh, the, the, the fog of war is lifted. He looks around now with tremendous opportunity. He goes, okay, this is ripe for the gospel. I've given my life to America. But he goes into the cities of America and he finds churches that are just gathering the elite and the wealthy. And he, he actually stood at the entrance of several churches several times asking every every person that came through, whether they were actually saved. He didn't believe they were saved. He's sort of like, this is lukewarm Christianity. They're preaching messages like pillows that are tickling people's ears. These are some of the things he said. And he looks at this and he realizes that 95% of Americans live in communities of less than 2,500 people. And he goes, these churches are only reaching the cities, the influential, the wealthy the elite, but they're not even touching the westward expansion of the gospel or the westward expansion of America where they have no access to a church and no access to a gospel. This is a critical moment where Asbury could just settle down, get in a nice church rhythm, become a well-known pastor and build something big in the city. But Asbury looks on and goes, no way. The kingdom is for the least, it's for the last, it's for the lost. It's for the person a hundred miles from the nearest city. It's, from the, it's for the town of 100. It's for that little settler community that's way out in the middle of nowhere and feels totally forgotten and totally isolated. And Asbury's passion to reach them created an innovation in his heart and his mind. And he took the church from the cities, he put it on the back of the horse, And he began to raise up and empower all these young leaders who may not have ever been been educated. Some of them couldn't even read. And yet he said to them, if you can preach the gospel, then you can take the kingdom to the frontiers. These riders began to ride all across America. And Asbury in his lifetime personally commissioned 4,000 
thousand Methodist circuit riders who scattered across America with an innovative mindset, thinking that knowing that they had to speak the language of the people, that they had to go where the people were of that day, that they needed to expand as the frontiers were expanding. And because of it, America saw a remarkable move of God. And Asbury sort of became one of the transitions from the first great awakening to the second great awakening. The impact of his life is hard to even put into perspective. It was said during his time that you could write a letter from anywhere in the world and as long as it said Francis Asbury, it would eventually find him. He was a man who never married, he never had a home, and he's the only man in all of history, they said, that rode more miles on a horse than John Wesley himself, estimating up to 210 thousand miles on the back of a horse. This was Asbury. In the eyes of the world, poor. In the eyes of the world, he had nothing. In the eyes of the world, he didn't even have a family and children. But in the eyes of the kingdom, he literally transformed the world around him. Imagine that. You're in some other nation and you want to write a letter to Asbury and all you have to do is write his name and it's going to find him. In fact, the most popular baby name in his lifetime was Francis, as all these families are naming their children after this selfless, sacrificial, innovative hero who joyfully, with grit and endurance, laid down his life for the sake of the gospel. Let's highlight this for one moment. All the times that Francis Asbury could have given up, the Revolutionary War, not being a great preacher, rejected by his father, his own denomination sort of thinking like he's okay, but he's not that amazing. All the people that vied for his position and his authority in America, especially as he became successful. Think of the temptations to lay aside his calling for wealth, for prestige. When you're that well-known in a nation, when you can write a letter anywhere in the world and find you, he could have done a hundred things to capitalize on that influence. Think of all the times he was tempted to give up because of hardship or to hand off his calling because of another offer that seemed more comfortable, that seemed more amazing. But Asbury, if you could define his life by one word, it was grit. He was unwilling to give up on the call of God on his life. In fact, he struggled with physical sickness the majority of his life. And there was this uh, story that was written about him that, that he had so much pain in his joints, which later they would write was probably a form of arthritis. But uh, they thought it was related to anemia and they weren't totally sure. So he would boil a hundred rusty nails in water. And then he would drink the water because it brought some sort of relief to the pain in his body. Who knows what it was really doing to his body. But this was Asbury's grit. He was unwilling to give up. The fruit of his life. The circuit riders grew from about 12 pastors when he arrived to well over 4,000. Methodism grew from somewhere around 200 to 200,000. By the time the Civil War hit America, there were 1.2 million Methodists in America. It was the fastest growing movement on the earth in his time. They were forerunners in the abolition of slavery and the slave trade. They were forerunners in the empowerment of women and the empower of, empowerment of every nation and every ethnicity. And they were forerunners in empowering the every day believer to bring the kingdom into their families and into their communities. His life radically transformed the nation of America and I would guarantee you that some of you listening to this and watching this right now, you don't even know it, but your life is a direct result of Francis Asbury's obedience who affected someone else, who affected someone else, who affected someone else that led to your salvation and you watching this video right now. All right, before we wrap up this session, let's talk about three application points. Number one is that we see in the life of Asbury this grit, this endurance. How many of you so many times in your life have been tempted to quit? You've got a promise, you've got a prophecy, you've got journal entries, you've started to take a few first steps and someone criticized you, someone looked down on you, someone said, I don't know if you're the most qualified to do that. And we're so often tempted to quit, not only because of hardship, but sometimes because of more um, offers that seem better. They seem more comfortable. They seem like we could have more influence. The first thing we can draw from Asbury's life, never quit on the word of the Lord because of hardship or because the grass seems greener on the other side. Never give up on the word of the Lord. Let it be said about our generation that we were a generation that never quit on the promises and the invitations and the commands of Jesus. He has a calling on your life. 
never give up on that calling. Number two, we see in the life of Francis Asbury that he was this uh, great empowerer of others. But think for just a moment. As a young man, he gets on fire for Jesus. He gets this dream in his life to become a preacher. But his dad looks at him and is sort of like, hey, I don't think you're good enough. And plus, you need to follow the family trade. Um, I, let someone else do this who's more qualified to do it. And the attack against Asbury's life was that he would never be obedient to the call of God, that he'd be under-empowered, he'd be controlled. And isn't it crazy that the attack on his life becomes the very anointing of his life? And it could possibly be said that no man in history empowered more everyday people to be participants in bringing the kingdom, revival, discipleship, and evangelism than Francis Asbury. The very area that wanted to hold him back became his anointing and empowerment resulted that literally changed the course of the nation. Your history, the thing that the enemy has most tried to attack you in, the things you might look back on from your family and your upbringing that we would all say weren't ideal or they were difficult. Well, the Redeemer, God, is so powerful and redemption is so outrageous that it can take the very thing that we think disqualifies us or that would hold us back and make it the primary anointing of our lives. We see that in Asbury's life, and I believe we see it in the life of a whole generation as we allow the Redeemer to touch every difficult thing in our history. Number three is we see in Asbury's life the power of innovation. And I just wanna say, this is an hour of innovation. It's easy to look around at other success stories of a, a large successful church or a large successful business or a really dynamic person with a growing social media following. And we can look at all those things and start to mimic them. But mimicking them is not going to help the call of God on your life. Your mission field needs your obedience. It doesn't need their obedience. And that's not to speak of what they're doing as being wrong. They're doing what they're supposed to do for their mission field. The question is, are we doing what we're supposed to do for our mission field? That's the innovation. The innovation's inside of us. It's called obedience to Jesus. And if we would not mimic or compare or just try and replicate what others, what others are doing because it seems successful, but instead walk out in the simple obedience of our lives, then every mission field would be impacted by the innovation of the missionary that's called to that field, whether it's in business, whether it's in media, or whether it's in the nations. Walk in simple obedience and you will find that you have the innovation to bring the gospel and bring the kingdom in the setting that God has called you to. Now we've just finished with Francis Asbury and the circuit riders, but I want you to stay tuned because we're going to kind of jump eras now and we're going to move into the mid 1800s and talk about one of the least known moves of God in America that was one of the most impacting moves of God in the history of America called the Layman's Prayer Revival. You're not going to want to miss it. <laughs>